Good morning. Welcome. Glad that you're all uh, with us this morning in, in July where it actually rained and Seattleites are giving thanks for the rain. That's pretty unusual. Amen. That's kind of a strange thing. So welcome. Glad you're with us. To those of you that join us online, welcome to you as well. We're glad you're with us. You can pick up the sermon notes and the small group questions if you're doing a small group based on the sermons by going to our Facebook account and you can find that by going to marysvillenaz.org. Well, we're uh, in, a, in our typical summer series. A lot of times I, I kind of go through the Old Testament stories, uh, in part because people just don't get as much exposure to them as they, they once did, and a lot of people haven't heard all of them. And, and some of you that have, some of you that grew up in Sunday school, you heard all the stories. You, you kind of heard the kid version, and there's nothing wrong with that. But the Old Testament stories were really written for adults. They're designed to teach uh, important adult lessons about life and God and relationship uh, with Him. And so sometimes I find even people that have been in the church a long time still have kind of a a childlike understanding of some of those stories. Uh, And so over summer, I can kind of expose you to stories and I can kind of uh, upgrade your understanding of them uh, a little bit. And I'll just say, I've told you this before, uh, the, the Old Testament especially uh, is kind of earthy sometimes. And the story we're going to do today has kind of some earthy parts of it. So I just kind of want to prepare you ahead of time. But, but that's by design and it's actually kind of a part of the truth uh, that's being taught in it. So I want to start this morning with a, with a little survey. How many of you have ever been robbed in one way or another? How many of you ever, oh, wow, <laughs> a lot of that. Most of you know that we got robbed. Our house got broken into uh, several months ago, you know. And uh, as traumatic as that was, we realized that, that, you know, we didn't really lose a lot of valuable stuff. We lost one thing that had some sentimental value. But, but really, it wasn't that bad. Now we just are paranoid about making sure all the doors are locked and all of that. Uh, but, but it gets worse as it gets more personal. Any of you ever been stuck up before or mugged or anything, had kind of the personal sort of, I talked to somebody today that had a gun pointed in their face. Yeah, and that, that's, that's a whole other level of, of robbery. That just kind of, that, that's, that's, that's tough. But I think the worst one is, is fraud. Uh, and I'm not going to ask you if you've ever been defrauded. Uh, but, but fraud is the worst because it actually kind of plays on our relationships. A fraud is when somebody uses a relationship with you in order to steal something from you, to take something uh, from you. And so it has a really kind of personal nature to it. And, and it's very, very difficult to get over uh, in a lot of ways. And I know this in part because uh, my parents were victim of, victims of fraud. In the 1990s, uh, dad was kind of finishing up his, his time in his career. And so they had their money in retirement. And a, and a wonderful Christian man came along and had a better plan for how they should invest it and what they should do with that. And over a period of time, they ended up putting all their money in all of this. And it turned out that he had been taken advantage of. And it was all a giant Ponzi scheme and they lost everything. They lost all of their retirement. Uh, and so it was just really painful. I mean, the loss of the money was one thing, but then the, the, the brokenness of the friendship and, and this person that took advantage, you know, and it just, it just, it was just awful. It just had this terrible sense of loss and, and, um, it just kind of weighed on us in, in, in all of that. And, and I think maybe the worst kind of fraud is spiritual fraud. Spiritual fraud is, is the thing that kind of damages relationship with God and it damages relationship with others. And um, anything really that, that is a departure from the one true God is spiritual fraud. Anything that, that, that separates you from that. And yet the world is filled with all kinds of spiritual fraud. And if you've experienced it, it, it leaves really deep, deep scars in us. Um, so we, we live in a world where there's all kinds of spiritual fraud, where in the name of God, people send children into to battles to shoot at one another. That's, that's spiritual fraud. We live in a world where, where spiritual fraud will, will, uh, will kill children uh, in the name of God and innocence in the name of God. Uh, we, we live in a world, sadly, where religious leaders uh, take advantage of their flock. And that, that one just drives me crazy because I, I really believe that being a pastor is a sacred trust and I just want to take a baseball bat to their head. And I know that's not a very pastorly thing to say, but <laughs> I'm just being honest here because they violate this trust that we have. And, and if, if you've ever experienced where you've been taken advantage of by a, a Christian or a church member or a pastor, that, that kind of spiritual fraud just, I mean, it leaves deep, deep scars uh, in people. And, and we live in a world where there's spiritual fraud around kind of false hope. You know, all you got to do is turn on your TV and for $200, if you send me your hanky, I'll send it back and all your problems will go away. What a great deal that is. 
It's just that it's a lie. <laughs> it's, it's false hope. It's, it's fraud. And the difficulty with, with spiritual fraud is that it, it robs you of your joy. It robs you of your relationship with God. It, it damages your relationship with God. It damages your relationship with others. And it can even be dangerous when you start getting into cults and, and those sorts of things that, that just rob you of life in so many ways. And so this morning, what I want to talk about, kind of the topic, is exercising spiritual fraud. Say exorcising. Not exercising, exorcising, <laughs> exorcising. Some of you do the exercising thing, but we're going to do the exorcising thing uh, today. Uh, and exercising um, is the idea of having to really dig the roots out, you know. Um, if you, if you, have you ever had like a really deep weed in your yard? You know, you can't just take the top off. You've got to dig out all the weeds and all of the parts. And if you leave any parts of it, it'll grow back. Want to know how I know that? Because I struggle with them in my yard. And so and exercise is this idea of getting all the little pieces and, and really digging in. And that's uh, kind of what that word means. Uh, and so we want to talk about exercising, getting rid of spiritual fraud in our life. And the, the part of the reason for that is that spiritual fraud really impacts all of our life. All of the world, everything is built on the spiritual. It's the foundation from which all else springs. And ultimately, all the rest of it will go away, but the spiritual uh, will stay. And so when you experience spiritual fraud and spiritual damage, it just touches all the other aspects of your life. It, it, it impacts your marriage. It impacts your relationship with your kids. It impacts your relationship with your friends and family and, and church and, and all of those sorts of uh, things. And so um, this morning, we want to look at a passage in the Old Testament that deals with this issue of spiritual spiritual fraud. Uh, and, and it's found in Exodus chapter 22. So if you have your Bibles, you can turn over to Exodus. It's real easy to find. The first book is Genesis. The second one is Exodus. So it's, it's not too bad. Uh, and um, we're going to be looking at, at uh, chapter 32. And it's a story you're pretty familiar with. Up, oh, just done to me. I need to stop for just a second. If you haven't, did everybody get their idol when they came in today? You know, I know it's a little strange. You came to church and they handed you an idol. But if you didn't get an idol, raise your hand. We want everybody to have an idol. Now, don't quote me out of context, okay? We got a couple more over here if we could get some. Everybody needs their idol this morning. We got some in the back, back there. Yeah, people are kind of enthusiastic about these idols. I don't know. We got some over here. <laughs> so, so if we everybody keep your hand up till they get you, they'll get you an idol. You want your idol. So while they're doing that, let me kind of bring you up to speed with Exodus chapter 32. The children of Israel, uh, as, as you know, ha- are, are in Egypt and they've been in slavery and they've been in slavery for 400 years, right? So generations and generations and generations. They have no real memory of not being slaves. They don't really know their God. They know they have a God that's different than the Egyptian gods, but there's been nobody to teach them and all of that. So they're just kind of learning about all of that and they've been in slavery and they're crying out to God for deliverance. And one day this guy named Moses stands up and shows up at the door and says to Pharaoh, set my people free. free. Yeah, you all know that line. How many of you have seen one of the Moses movies in some way or another? Oh, good. Turn your imaginations on. We'll play into some of that this morning. So, of course, Pharaoh, knowing that that's the entire workforce of Egypt, does not take this very well, right? So he wants a few signs, and he gets more than a few. He gets ten of them, and they're plagues. And each one is worse than the other, and it's it's really bad. And finally we get down to the tenth plague, tenth plague, and as you know, it's it's the uh, it's the angel of death and and all of the firstborn that are, are die that aren't protected under the covenant and the blood and all that piece we've talked about before. Um, and so finally, at that point, he's like, "Get these people out of here! I want nothing to do with them. Get them out of here as quick as you can go." And of course, the people leave and on their way out, uh, the, they they ask the Egyptians for the, all the gold they have, and the Egyptians so want these people out of here, they give the Israelites all their gold. Just get out of here, get out of here, uh, get out of here, and they head into the desert. And Pharaoh must not have been all that bright a guy, right? I have never figured this out. He's gone through all of these ten plagues. His whole kingdom is devastated. He's lost his firstborn. And so he changes his mind anyway and begins to pursue the children of Israel. Okay, not terribly bright guy, but he does this. He sends the army there. And so there's more miracles. They've seen all these miracles of plagues. And now there's another miracle. They're they're pressed up against the Red Sea. They think they're going to die. The Egyptian army, which is the strongest army in the world, at this point, the superpower, it's got chariots, which is the superpower of that time, and descending on them, and all of a sudden, God shows up in a pillar of smoke at, at, during the day and a pillar of fire at night and separates the two armies. They can't get through that. 
Huge miracle, right? And so then finally God says, we're taking you out of here. He opens up the Red Sea, you know, Moses holds up his hands and and the children of Israel escape through that. And then uh, the children of Israel get to the other side and God brings down the, the, uh, the, the pillar of smoke. Now, Pharaoh, again, being the bright guy that he is, as if he hasn't heaven us, decides that it'd be a good idea to pursue the children of Israel into the Red Sea. And you all know the rest of that. They get about halfway in and God closes it all up. And the greatest army the world has known at that point is wiped out in a single kind of moment. And so these people, although they don't know God, they have seen huge miracles going on in all kinds of ways. Uh, they go into the desert from there and they're, they're hungry and God provides manna. And when they're thirsty, God provides water out of a rock. It's just miracle after miracle after miracle. And this whole thing is about three months, right? They've just seen thing after thing after thing after thing, how their God has opposed the gods of Egypt and has, has defeated them. They get to the mountain of the Lord uh, and they, they, they make camp around there. And Moses says to the people, hey, uh, God has called me into executive session at the top suite at the top of the place up of the mountain. And he and I are going to have a chit chat and I'll come back and let you know, give you a report about what God has to say at the end of all of this. And so Moses goes up the mountain. Now here's the problem. I don't know if you've ever noticed this, but God never seems to be on my timetable. Have you noticed that? He always takes longer than he's supposed to. And so they begin to have a problem. Well, let me, let me give you the verse. Uh, verse 1, uh, chapter 32, it says, When the people saw that Moses delayed come down, to come down from the mountain, the people gathered themselves together to Aaron and said to him, Get up, make us gods who shall go before us, for this Moses, as for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we don't know what has become of him. Now that's interesting. They have three complaints against Moses and more importantly against God. And see if you recognize these. You probably never suffer like this. You're not like the children of Israel. You got it together. But here are their complaints. The first one is God is taking too long. How many of you have ever thought God was taking too long? Yeah, you walk with God very long. Yeah. Number two, he's not providing enough direction. He's not filling us in on what we should be doing. God, you need to get on the program and get this done. How many of you have ever felt like God didn't provide enough direction? Yep, okay. And then number three, he's left us in the dark about what he's doing. He's not keeping us filled in. He's not exercising good communication skills and keeping us in the loop. How many of you have ever experienced that one? Welcome to the children of Israel. You're all Hebrews in the desert this morning. And, and so they're, they're frustrated with God. And the truth of the matter is, if you walk with God long enough, you are eventually going to feel like God has let you down in some sort of way. God didn't do what you thought he should do, or he did something you didn't think he should do, or he didn't do it on time, or he did it too soon, or he didn't do the way you thought it should do, or he left you in the dark till the end, and and la da 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 I've been walking with the Lord a long time, and i got to tell you, sometimes I have no idea what he's up to. It's just like, you know, if you could just send me an email, this would be really helpful, Lord, but no, okay? And so we have times when it doesn't turn out the way we, we think it should. And, and we get disappointed with God and we get frustrated with God and sometimes we get angry with God and we get, you know, we get kind of in that sort of funk with God. And, and the truth that kind of comes out of this text is this. Spiritual fraud often begins when you experience disappointment with God. There's something about that moment when you're disappointed or you're angry or you're frustrated with God where we are kind of open to alternate kinds of explanations. There's, there's something about that and, and people who are fraudsters know how to take advantage of that and we, we just want to stop the pain or we want the thing to be fixed or we want God to get on this thing or, or that thing. And, and that's exactly where the Hebrews were. They, they were feeling vulnerable. They were in a desert. They had lived all of their lives as slaves with somebody telling them what to do and taking care of them. And they're anxious and they're alone. There's nobody else out there with them. And, and so they, they, they make a fatal mistake. They get, makes them, they're vulnerable, uh, to fraud and then they, they fall to fraud. And so here's kind of what happens next. Aaron, who is the second in the command, he's the XO, he's the second banana. He's the guy that's in charge while Moses is in executive session. He's supposed to lead them and take care of them through all of this. Uh, and, and they come to him and they say, they give him their list of complaints. Now what he should have said, of course, you all know this is, Wait, it's okay. You can wait for God. God will come through in the end. You can trust God. All of that sort of stuff that you don't say to yourself when you're mad at God. He should have said that to them. Instead, he says something really, really important. He says, 
Give me your gold. Now that tends to blow right past us when we normally read this, but I need you to kind of get some context here. Where did they get the gold? Egypt. That was the blessing God gave them going out. That was kind of the payment, if you will, for the slavery. That was the thing God put into their lives as, they, as Egypt handed over all of their, their gold to them. And so they've, they've got this gold. And so he's saying, hand over your blessing for coming out of slavery. Give me your gold. This is the only money they have. They've been slaves. They haven't got wages. They haven't got any of that. And he takes that gold, that very blessing coming out of Egypt, and he forms it into a golden calf. Solid gold calf, an idol. And and the thing about idols is, you know, when we look at these, we think, oh, I remember hearing this thing as a kid as a story and going, who would worship a golden calf? How stupid do you have to be to do that? Only fools would do that. I've never seen anybody bow down to a cow unless they were trying to milk it, you know. (laughs) What, that hadn't occurred to you? (laughs) You should give thanks for your milk every day, okay? But I would offer to you that the idols of that time are different from the idols of this time. Here's the definition of idol. Anything that comes between you and God. Anything. Not, not just little animals that look nice. But anything that comes between you and God. None of us would worship a golden cow, okay? We're way too sophisticated for that. But let me ask you this question. What tends to get between you and God? What comes between that relationship? What challenges that relationship? That thing is an idol. And for Israel, it was a golden calf. We can laugh at them, but they lived in a different time and a different period. And the interesting thing about this is this, that calf was no accident. Egyptians worshipped cows, and specifically the calf. And so Aaron not only took the gold that was the blessing coming out of Egypt, but he literally formed it into an Egyptian god. Do you get the blasphemy that's going on in all of this? Do you get how offensive that wasn't just any old God? It was literally the God of the, of the people that had enslaved you, that had done all of those things for you. And, and, and in spite of all that they had seen, in spite of all the plagues, in spite of the deliverance, in spite of the death of angel, in spite of the cloud of smoke and, the, and fire and, and going through the, the, the Red Sea and, and the bread and the water, in spite of all of that, he literally makes for them the Egyptian God. See how adult this is? This is big stuff in the midst of of all of this for them. And so then verse 4, here's where it gets. This is just, this verse is sickening. I mean, it's just, it's sickening. He says to them, and they said, these are your gods, O Israel. Let that sink in for a minute. Who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. They literally said to them, I'm going to give the God that enslaved you the credit for delivering you. And I'm going to push God out of it, the God of the Hebrews. The God who had defeated these gods, they come back in this, in this moment of that. You can imagine the, the power of, of, of the sacrilege and the, 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 the dirtiness of that moment when the, the slave God takes the credit for all that's been done. You see, when you give credit to something other than God for what God has done, that's an idol. That's an idol. When we fail to recognize all the things that God has done in our life and done for us and the way He's moving, and we say, well, actually, it's because I'm really smart. That's an idol. Well, actually, it's because I'm really rich. That's an idol. Well, actually, it's I'm... Well, not no, well, actually, nothing. Well, God has done it in your life. And then they, they, they go on and they throw a giant party. That's the next step. They begin literally to have sacrifices to this God, this golden God of Egypt, of their oppressors. They make sacrifices. They dance. They sing. They, they drink. It's, it's a wild sort of thing. And they are literally worshiping the God that had enslaved them. Do you get the power of this moment? So let me give you this truth. Frauds 
will always betray you. The people of Israel were betrayed in that moment. The, 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 the golden calf could never do anything for them. The golden calf was their uh, oppressor. And whatever your, your golden calf, whatever your idol is, whatever that thing that comes between you and God, I am telling you, it will let you down. It will disappoint you. It will hurt you. It will leave you empty. It will cause you to miss out on God's blessing for you. Oh, it always starts good. Sin always is good in the beginning or you wouldn't participate in it. It's poison. I mean, if poison tasted bad, you wouldn't drink it. Poison that poisons people always tastes good. It starts out well and ends bad. And so it is with idols. That thing that comes between you and God, that golden calf, it starts out wonderful, but in the end it will betray you. It will let you down. You, you think God has disappointed you. You have not experienced disappointment until you've experienced putting your trust in an idol. Then you experience real disappointment. If you put your hope or trust in anything other than the true God, you will be betrayed. You will be let down. So Moses comes down the mountain finally. And he comes down to the people and he sees all the worship that's going on and all this. I kind of think of this, "Uh uh-oh, mama's home kind of thing with Moses as he shows up there. All the partying's going on and he is angry and he breaks the tablets he's so angry in that moment and then he goes to the golden calf and this is where it really gets interesting it records that he goes to the golden calf and he pulls it down and he throws it into the fire which of course makes a solid golden calf melt right and it just goes melts down into nothing and then he it says he takes the golden the calf out and most people don't read this part very carefully and it says that he grinds it into a really really fine powder all of this gold and he puts it on the water and he makes them drink it now i want you to think about this just for a minute this is their god their god has been reduced to a fine powder and put on the water and they have literally drunk their god What happens, the body, by the way, will not absorb gold. What happens to anything you swallow that the body will not absorb? Comes out the other end, right? So basically, and this is where it's graphic, and I apologize, but this is important because it it carries in a truth. They literally, excrement is their God. They literally, out the other end, the God is mixed in with the excrement. This, this story should not be st- told the story of the golden calf. It should be the story of the golden excrement. Okay, That would be a better title for this. And there's an interesting thing that's going on because there's this war between the God of the Hebrews, between Yahweh and the God of the Egyptians. And God has defeated them over and over and over again with all of the plagues in the desert, all of those places. And now one final time when they turn themselves back to the idols of Egypt, God so defeats this one that he literally turns it into excrement. And they literally out of their own bodies. There's a picture for you about theology, isn't it? You're not going to forget that story very soon. When he gets done with that, he turns to his cousin Aaron and he says, Why? Why, Aaron? Why did you do this? And, and the lies begin at this point. Aaron, Aaron looks at his, his, his cousin Moses and he says, Those people you left me with, they did this. That was a lie. He did it. Of course, he had told another lie earlier when he said, This is the God that delivers you. So now he's into two lies. And then he tells the whopper of all whoppers, verse 4, he says, I took the gold and I threw it into the fire and the goat, the calf, just came out. I don't know what happened. If you have to tell a lie about it, it's an idol. I want to bore down just a little bit here. And I know I'm going to give up preaching and go to meddling right now. But if you have a secret... It's an idol. If you have to tell a lie about it, it's an idol. If there's something in your life you can't let your wife know about or you can't let your husband know about or you can't let your friends know about, it's an idol. Now, not every idol gets lied about. Some people just put it right out there. But every lie covers an idol. And I know I'm digging in here a little bit. But it's just so important that you understand this. Our our, our idols are not golden cows. Our idols are very often secret sins. That file of information that you would not want anyone to know about. God knows about it. And it's a problem. If you have a secret, 
you have an idol. And so I want to spend the rest of our time together. I want to talk to you a little bit about how to exercise the idols in your life based on this scripture. How, how to get it out. And, and the, the bad news is God knows your secret. You cannot hide sin from God. The good news is when God reveals sin, he always does it so he can redeem you. So hold on to that. So number one, the first thing to excise, ex, ex, yeah, that to idols is number one, you have to name your idol. So you all got your idol. Everybody get your idol out. Hold on for, for just a minute. If you look at it on one side, there's a golden calf, an idol. Now your idol doesn't look like that, but that'll just be our symbol. If you look on the other side of it, it says, my name is. And I want you to name your idol this morning. You don't have to write it down there if it's too personal. If you can, do that because that can kind of be helpful. But you know what it is. Maybe it's pride. I can do it myself. I'll take care of it. Maybe maybe it's I'll fix it if God doesn't fix it. Maybe it's an addiction. Maybe it's a relationship that you know is not right but you don't want to give up. Maybe it's some other secret sin. And can I just, I'm just going to say this out loud. Um, we live in a world filled with secret sins. And we need to especially pray, pray for young men that are struggling with pornography. It's a secret sin. And it's defeating them. And ladies, don't beat up on the guys for this. They're struggling with it. But I'm here to tell you, if it's a secret, it's an idol. And God has something better for you than all of that. Maybe maybe it's your toys. Those are your idols. Maybe it's a behavior. Maybe it's a relationship. Maybe, I don't know, maybe it's politics. I look at Christians sometimes and I go, man, if you think politics are going to deliver us, it's an idol. Amen? And I don't care which side of the aisle you're on. They are never going to pass a bill that saves the world. It just isn't going to happen. Only Jesus is going to save the world. Amen? So name your, name your idol. And then the second thing you gotta do is you gotta burn your idol, okay? You, you gotta take it someplace and you gotta get rid of it. That's what the, the burning did. It, it, it melted it down. And, and so I wanna encourage you to, to hold on to this. And, and, and when you're ready, when you're ready to give up your idol, take it someplace and burn it. Now don't do it out in the woods because we don't wanna start a fire, okay? That would be bad. But, but take it someplace safe. And, and maybe, maybe even you just hold on to this because you're not ready to let go of your idol yet. Be at least honest enough to say, I'm not ready to let go of my idol. And I'm going to be praying that one day God will bring that to you. You'll run across this and you'll be ready to let go of your idol. So, so set it on fire. Uh, and that, that symbolizes the, the no going back part of it. And then make your idol, uh, number three, make your idol uh, excrement to you. It is, it is to, to take that thing and make it something that you don't ever want to be involved with again. To, to learn from it. My, my dad was a, a recovering alcoholic. He was an alcoholic before he became a follower of Jesus and then he was a recovering alcoholic. And one of the things that transpired in his life is that, that as he got further away from that, he went back and he helped alcoholics a lot. He was very involved with the, the rescue mission work and that sort of thing. And, and a part of that was because of the change that had happened in him. He thought when his wife was falling apart that alcohol was the answer to all of that. That if he just drank more, he'd just numb him and he'd eventually get better and he found himself in a very, very bad place. And then when God changed that in his life, he began to see that the very thing that he thought was gold was excrement. And he went back to help guys that were caught and were trapped in that. And so there, there's power when you get free of your idol to going back and helping others to, to realizing that that thing is such an awful thing. And then the story kind of ends in this this powerful sort of way. Moses stands up in front of all the people and he says this, Who is on the Lord's side? Come to me. And when I was a kid growing up, I, I thought of that as a really condemning kind of verse because what happens after that is those that reject the Lord are killed. But, but as I've grown older, I've come to see that this is a verse of mercy and grace and love because everybody deserved to be wiped out. Nobody deserved mercy, but God had mercy on his people. He says, if you will come to me, if you'll be honest and you'll come back to me, I'll forgive you. Step over the line. This is the line in the sand, Moses says. Step over and and join the Lord and you can find redemption and you can find healing and you can find new life and you can find deliverance from the idols in your life. This is the mercy moment. Who is on the Lord's side? You tired of serving your idol? You're tired of keeping the secret? 
You tired of the energy that goes into all of that? Be honest with God this morning. And the God that was there with Moses is the same God that's here to say, that says, who's on the Lord's side? Join me. Come to me. And then just last, exercising idols creates freedom in your life. The good news is that when you get rid of those, you can experience God's blessing. The children of these people go into the land of promise and experience all that God has for them. They they are blessed as God watches over them. God has so much for you. And the idol is the robber. It's the one that takes away the blessing that God has for you. It's the fraud. It says, trust me, when in fact what it'll do is take away spiritual life for you. In just a minute, we're going to sing a really great song. It says that God will never let go of you. And before we do that, I'm going to pray for you. And I want to pray specifically for those of you that are grappling with an idol this morning. We're going to worship the Lord in giving as well. Great time to put your communication card in. But, but I want you to, I want you to take a moment. If you, you have an idol in your life, our musicians could come. And I want you to just be honest with God and admit you got an idol. You don't have to confess it to me. Praise God. But you need to confess it to God. It's not that you're going to inform him. He's not going to be surprised. He already knows, okay? But in confessing that you own it. And maybe you could have a really good accountability partner you could confess that to as well. And if somebody does that with you, man, do not pass judgment on them. You are not the judge God is. And the very fact that they've confessed it means they're in the process of redemption and reconciliation. Amen? And all of that. And then let's just be a body of healing together. And let's let go and then go burn your idol someplace. And then sing this song, God will never, ever let go of you. You can't sin so much that God can't forgive you. And you can't sin so big that it's unpardonable. You're not that good. God is bigger than your sins. Would you bow your heads with me? Heavenly Father, Lord, I I know this morning that I've kind of dug into some stuff and I've probably made some people uncomfortable. And there's some folks that just came to church hoping they'd hear something happy and Now they're grappling with something that you've pointed out in their life that's an idol and they're struggling with it, Father. They don't want to let go or they want to let go, but they don't know how to let go. And They can see that it's damaging them and it's robbing them of the life. It's maybe robbing them of relationship with their their spouse or their kids or their family. So, Father, I just lift every one of them that, that this morning has come to realize that they have an idol. And I pray, Father, that in this moment, even right now, they would just surrender that to you. They'd name it and surrender it to you and be honest about it, Father. And that they would give it over to you. And that they would they would respond to your call that who is on the Lord's side, they would say, I am. And they would come and cross over. And So I ask right now, Father, that you would move all across this place by your Spirit, redeeming, forgiving, recreating life, Father to your glory and to your honor. And we were careful to give you all of the honor and all of the glory, Father. And thank you, God, that even when we're worshiping idols, you don't let go of us, Father. We love you. We thank you. And we ask this in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen.